Welcome to the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center here at the University of New Haven. I'm Mike McGuire, and this is a special edition of Pitch Perfect. You know, at Pitch Perfect, well, we like to have students come and compete in a Shark Tank-like environment, but tonight's a little different. We've invited some experienced entrepreneurs to talk about their experiences and provide some guidance for our student entrepreneurs. So tonight, I have Mike Votto from Votto Vines Importing and Phil Viscomi from Business Growth Advisors. And we're going to talk a little bit about their entrepreneurial journey, and we're also going to talk about how do we build an entrepreneurial mindset, culture, ecosystem where we live. All right, so first, um, Mike, amazing story about how you went from the corporate attorney world into the world of wine distribution. So why don't you give us a quick summary of how that all happened? Sure. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me, Mike. Pleasure to uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah. So I uh, I grew up in a big Italian American family, just uh, about 15 miles from here in, in Cheshire, Connecticut. My dad was born just actually up the street in the Boulevard in New Haven. Huh. And so while I was off going to school and pursuing a, uh, a route as a as an attorney, myself, my cousins, brothers. Uh, brother, brother-in-law, we always had this interest in, in, in wine and spirits just from growing up in a big Italian family. And so uh, we saw an opportunity about 10 years ago coming off of a, a trip to Italy where we visited some small wineries who explained why they didn't have distribution in the U.S. and developed a plan to start bringing in um, wines from small Italian wineries in, uh, uh, in Italy. And so we just went with it, uh, launched the business really small, um, all kept our full-time jobs, and just built, uh, just started building it brick by brick in 2009, coming right out of the recession. It's amazing, because the, the common wisdom would be, you know, this is the worst time mm -hmm. to start a business and, and, and to, to try and disrupt an existing distribution of a, a business that's been around since the Bible, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so it's, pretty, it's pretty old. So uh, you took this leap, but you know, one of the things you did, and this is something to learn from, is that you kept your day jobs. Yep. So you took this idea and you began to fertilize it and move it forward while still having an income and having a fallback. Is that the way to think about it? Yeah, that is the way to think about it. And it was, it was, a, unique, it was a unique model and, and really wouldn't work for all businesses. But in this case, uh, we, didn't, we had no idea that it was going to grow into the business that it is today. It was really more of an, uh, a family passion project. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of, again, for me at the time, I had uh, a one-year-old and my wife was pregnant with our second. Oh, that's uh, a very low risk yeah, part of, exactly. your, of a life journey. That's great. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the idea of just giving up my career and trying to fundraise for a startup wine importing and distribution business just wasn't in the cards. Uh, my youngest cousin was just getting out of school. My brother was just getting out of school, undergrad. Um, and so we thought, let, let, let's really test this, test mm -hmm. our thesis um, in, in, in a reasonable way before we, before we start jumping in with two feet. Wow, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. So the second variable you threw into this entrepreneurial journey was the family. Mm. Right? So this is a family business. So mm -hmm. how's that dynamic been? What, what have you learned about that experience? Because there are a lot of, a lot of family businesses out there um, and in the future, you're going to deal with the succession issues, right, mm -hmm. and how that all works. But right now, what are the issues that you deal with, and, and what have you learned? <laughs> One of the first questions pe people always ask us. I think we have um, we've been really unique in, in how well everyone's gotten along. Not always easy, tricky with sometimes with accountability issues and that close, uh, you know, familiar relationship, of course. Um, but we've been blessed in that in that the five founders, we all have kind of a different skill set um, mm -hmm. and get along really well. So I would say, you know, 90, 95% of the time, it's been great. Um, and there's always, there's always tough moments, whether it's any business or, or particularly a family business. But I think we've been able to, um, to manage it uh, well and all try to be transparent and, and, and open and honest with each other. So is any family member in charge or do you sort of manage things on a committee basis. No, no, I'm in charge. You're in charge. Yeah, we'll, in charge. Be, we'll, be, so we'll make certain to make sure that's clear. I hope no, all the, the rest of your, your the guys family members say, know this. The guys would say the same thing and, and Phil will appreciate this. <laughs> as the oldest uh, as the oldest of my, my generation in Italian family, I'm like the de facto next head of the family. <laughs> all right, so okay, so we have some uh, so we have some cultural <laughs> precedence here that's to, right. to deal with. That's right. Remind me not to mess with you in, in any in any way. 
Um, <laughs> all right, so let's let's talk about. So this is clearly a, uh, this was an entrepreneurial venture. Mm -hmm. Um, you're now moving into a stage where you're beginning to scale mm -hmm. and you're growing and you've been here for 10 years. Yep. How do you maintain that entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. and that, that thing that got you here mm -hmm. um, to help take you to the next level and not get bogged down in, in bureaucracy and innovation being squelched and that kind of thing? Yeah, um, I think for us, you know, we're, we're, we've got about 20 people now in total. Um, so it's still a relatively yep. small business. And, and closely held the five founders, a, few, uh, a number of other family members. So I mean, it's a 20 person team, about half of us of which are here in, in the headquarters in Connecticut. Um, and, and, and so we're still able to be, I think, very nimble and, and, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurial, and especially to an, in our industry, which is, which is largely defined by very, very large companies, right. whether it's uh, large importers, distributors, publicly traded companies like Diageo that, that have so much influence on, on, on our industry. And th those are obviously very large, very large companies with a whole structure that's completely different than ours. Whereas, you know, for us, you know, a couple of us or, or the five of us that started the business with input from the team, I mean, we, we, we're making decisions every day. Yeah, so it's, it's being nimble, mm -hmm. it's the speed of decision making, yeah. and you've got these behemoths that are trying to um, you know, by committee, either make decisions and or look at product innovation and or look at market opportunity and you see it, you smell it, you do it. That's right. And that's, that sounds to me like, is obviously very entrepreneurial. Yep. Um, and it, that's gonna be a challenge moving forward, I would imagine for you just to keep yeah, that. Of course, anytime you're, anytime you're going in business, that's definitely one of the, one of the tensions. Yeah. All right, so Phil, turning to you, and we're gonna, we're gonna zoop, you know, zoop up a little bit to a larger ecosystem, whether it's uh, an entrepreneurial mindset here at the University of New Haven, uh, it's the city of New Haven, it's the state of Connecticut. We're all searching for that, that um, entrepreneurial ecosystem that generates opportunity, creates innovation, and moves things forward. So moving out of the company setting to a broader setting, what are the things, what are the best practices, what are the elements that you think are necessary for a, a healthy and vibrant, vibrant um, entrepreneurial ecosystem? Interesting question, Mike. Uh, I'm a Connecticut guy. I've been here all of my life with the exception of living in Florida for, from 2000 to 2013. I was recruited there to go down and start and build and flip a business. And we did that in about eight, well, eight years. And that was great. We returned value to our investors and, and moved forward. In the course of that, I became familiar with the um, Florida ecosystem. The Florida ecosystem is very interesting. Uh, there are many components, and I'm sure I don't have every exact detail correct, but the uh, Florida starts at the, the state. I think it's one and a half percent of the state pension fund money goes into building the entrepreneurial mm. infrastructure within the state. That's at a state level. Uh, at a regional level and a county level, uh, each state, the Broward, Dade, and the southern part of it, all take some of these funds for infrastructure. Uh, combine them with very strong mentor programs, universities. Uh, there seems to be an accelerator in every corner. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very much flying together in formation. The thing I find interesting that I haven't identified in Connecticut yet is these companies are focused on an end objective. They can say that we want to invest this much money in these many companies to get to a certain end state in a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. So it's a very pragmatic, thought through type of an approach. Uh, they're very organized in their mentoring. And a lot of people who have flipped business, perhaps Mike might be in a, uh, on the way to Florida after you sell your business. <laughs> no, no, he's not leaving. We're keeping him right here, but go ahead. <laughs> the yeah. wine can stay, but <laughs> don't know about yeah. Mike. So the, it's interesting that um, all of these things come together in a very orderly way. One of the factors that plugs in, and it contrasts interesting, it's an interesting contrasting point with Connecticut, is in Florida, uh, it started at the University of Florida, and uh, that school put together something called the Technology Commercialization, Florida State Technology Commercialization Program. What this program is, is it's all of the intellectual property that comes from the state university system and NASA. So an entrepreneur or someone who's mentoring and coaching or building an entrepreneur program mm -hmm. can look at this technology, utilizing their industry experience, identify technologies that might match with a particular segment in the marketplace and begin to put together an entrepreneurial team. Oftentimes in the programs, early stage programs, 
we're sending people off to identify problems at the train station in New Haven on the green, what have you. Yeah. And the raw material for building a business comes from things that create value, where one's going to come up with raw material, generate a margin, and understand what niche it goes to. I think in the case of Florida, Texas also is uh, down in Austin, they're doing a great job on this. And everybody learned from Silicon Valley. And uh, these programs began at Silicon Valley. Uh, it's interesting that at Silicon Valley, now Stanford, they're running programs in graduate level. Stanford runs a graduate program where students have to apply to be in the program. And that application requires that they submit a shell business plan saying where they're going, how they're going to do it, the competitive position, what marketplace and segments, and also what their margin plan is going to be. And with that data, they're matched with experienced entrepreneurs. And I think our state of Connecticut needs to build an ecosystem that includes those kinds of components, along with clear objectives to start a certain number of jobs. And to go back for a moment, uh, talking about the uh, patents that the University of Florida helps commercialize. In Connecticut, I don't, uh, we were talking about this one day, but I believe it's um, sixth in the country for the number of patents produced and 48th in the country for the amount of new business starts. Hmm. Now there's a com tremendous uh, contradiction. Right. And if we can understand how to solve that problem, fuel it with the concepts of, in our education system, curiosity, connecting opportunity, and creating value, those three C's, curiosity, connecting ideas and creating value, uh, we can begin to achieve a pragmatic growth plan for new businesses in Connecticut. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So in listening to what you're saying, the number one, you need, you need a governmental, governmental commitment to that. It needs to be funded. Um, you need to engage the academic institutions mm -hmm. um, very much and, and harness the intellectual property. You need to engage the entrepreneurial community, right? The mentors, the ones who have done it and have that experience into this mix and you need to set goals. You need to say, look, you know, in Connecticut we're going to start this many businesses and you start with the goal and then you find out how to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seems like those are the key ingredients for, for, for our ecosystem to grow and be successful because clearly we need it. There's no doubt about it. I mean, there's a, there's a real thirst for it in the state. Here at the University of New Haven, you know, we created this entrepreneurship and innovation program for that re very reason. And by the way, the students want this. They want the education. They want to move forward. So. Uh, that's very insightful. That's, that's, a, that's a great roadmap, and hopefully that, that will be adopted here in Connecticut. But um, as an entrepreneur in Connecticut, what would you like to see different, changed? What, what, do, you, what do you need as, as the tools and the fodder for you to continue to be successful? I think one of the things you always, you always look for is, is that local support. And so, again, for us, a little bit different because in an importing and distribution company, we're not interfacing with, 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 consume, with the end consumer yeah. um, as much as, uh, you know, say, say certain other types of businesses. But I will say in the time that I've been, been back in Connecticut now, now almost 10 years, I, I've definitely seen some, some strides being made, whether it's, uh, you know, again, in, in our business, we, 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 we know and follow a lot of the microbreweries. And we've got a great, great infrastructure of, of some Connecticut microbreweries, one right up the street from us that seems to be garnering a lot of local <laughs> support. We actually were fortunate to receive a grant from the state of Connecticut um, last year. And even just this week, for the first time that I ever remember, I, I got a letter from, from the Department of um, DECD uh, congratulating us on making the Inc. 5000 again, uh, oh, which they hadn't excellent. done in the past. So I think excellent. they're definitely... Uh, it seems that there's some folks in Hartford paying, I think, a closer attention, and of course, CT Innovations, um, with their with their venture with their venture fund. So I think that's all a big part of it. The other part of it, which which makes it a little bit cyclical, is I think you've got to have you got to have the vibrant cities and communities where young people want to live. Right. And, and that that's I think always the tricky part for Connecticut. Um, and certainly, um, uh, of course, I'm biased, but I mean, I love I, I love New Haven. I love downtown New Haven. But I think if you're a young, if you're a young person coming out of school, um, and you're going to start a business or you're going to join a startup, yeah. you know, I think we're obviously you're going to Brooklyn. You're going to Boston. Exactly, Boston, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So yeah. I think as as more of the as more of the entrepreneurs stay home and recognize some of the benefits um, of of being in Connecticut, hopefully that that will, that will feed upon itself. Well, that's great. I, I mean, this in this short discussion, there's a lot of great stuff that, that's come out of this and. You know, I think there's, there's, uh, there's reason to be optimistic. And I really appreciate uh, the both of you coming, Phil Viscomi and Mike Votto. And uh, this is Mike McGuire 
from the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center here um, at the University of New Haven and here for Pitch Perfect. And so tune in to our next show where we, we will have the, the students competing and pitching their ideas uh, for judges to evaluate to move on to the next round. So thank you and we'll see you on the next show.